CN8, the Comcast Network. This is Nightbeat with Barry Nolan. Failure in the classroom is often tied to lack of funding for poor teachers, boring or out-of-date textbooks, and large class sizes. But what if they're not entirely to blame? What if it's the work ethic of the kids themselves? A recently released study out of the University of Pennsylvania suggests that it is a student's lack of self-discipline that is causing so many kids to fall short. Joining me tonight to discuss the study from our CNA Philadelphia studio, Angela Duckworth, one of the studies lead, studies lead researchers and current doctoral candidate at Penn. Thanks for joining us. Good evening. So, uh, I was looking at your resume. You are an incredible student and uh, quite a scholar, and you are obviously not the sort of person that has any problem with self-discipline. <laughs> I don't know if that would be entirely true, but I'm generally a self-disciplined person, yes. So, one of the things you were looking at is, is there something that is a better predictor of success in school as measured by grades than simple IQ? Is that about right? That's exactly right. And what did you find? Why did you go about looking at self-discipline? There's a lot of things you could look at. Uh, humor, uh, ability to be a weasel. Right. Yeah, I mean, there are, there's an infinite list of qualities that you know, teachers and parents would agree are important, like empathy, kindness, and so on. But self-discipline is of particular interest if you think about what a kid needs to do at a, at a difficult time to do it, right? In, in our case, we looked at adolescence. And school is all about doing what you need to do when you don't feel like doing it, and at the same time, not doing what you really feel like doing when you really want to. So take, for example, you know, having to sit down to write the outline for a term paper that's due three months later when really you'd be um, much happier talking to your friends on the telephone. So this is one quality which when you talk to teachers, and I myself taught for four years in public school classrooms, that, that you know, universally is acknowledged as perhaps the key problem in terms of behavior um, and what's a barrier between kids achieving their intellectual potential. So one of the things you looked at then is uh, how do you adequately measure something like self-discipline and you found that what you need to do is have a bunch of different sources coming in and uh, measuring it like parents, teachers and the kid himself. Exactly. IQ is something that's uh, it's a notion, it's an idea that's been around for over a century. And if you want to measure it, there are a number of tests that you can pull off the shelf and reliably get a child's IQ estimate. Self-discipline is um, much uh, less studied, and therefore, you know, there is no off-the-shelf measure of, you know, how do I measure my child or my student's IQ. So in this case, we ask the kids themselves to rate themselves on a 13-item questionnaire and another questionnaire. We ask parents and teachers to do the same thing. Um, and then we also did delay of gratification tests with kids, essentially seeing whether they could wait for a larger reward in the future versus taking an immediate temptation. Explain how that uh, delay of gratification test worked. I think that's cool. In one of our tests, and this is modeled on something that they actually uh, originally did with four-year-olds, um, the four-year-old test involves asking the four-year-old whether they would rather have one marshmallow immediately or whether they would rather wait for a certain period of time for a second marshmallow. Um, we wanted to extend that paradigm to eighth graders but most eighth graders that I know aren't terribly interested in marshmallows um, and so what we did was we gave the children a dollar for doing our questionnaires and we said had them actually hold the dollar in their hands so making the temptation you know right there to keep, put it in their pocket and we said look if you would want the dollar right now that's fine put it away if you wait a week we'll come back and we'll give you two dollars instead so essentially do you want double your money but you have to wait a week or do you want the one dollar right away and in our study we found that about one one in five children took the dollar right away. About four in five children decided to wait a week for double their money. One of the fascinating things about that old classic four-year-old marshmallow study is that it was apparently a very powerful predictor of uh, academic success a decade later. Exactly. Over a decade later, it's, it's kind of unbelievable almost. Um, the number of seconds that a four-year-old could wait for a second marshmallow actually predicted SAT scores, academic functioning in other ways, social functioning, um, friendship quality with peers. Um, it's some pretty astounding results, and that inspired us to do the same thing with uh, 12 and 13-year-olds. i got to tell you, I tried this test with my three kids, and I gave them a dollar. They looked at me and they said, a dollar? 
I don't do anything for a dollar. What's wrong with you? <laughs> right. And, and, you know, ideally we'd use more tempting amounts like $10 versus $15, but um, then your study gets quite expensive and uh, the people who run your budget get mad at you. Very interesting, um, the questions on your uh, self-administered questionnaire. You're supposed to, uh, the items are endorsed on a one to five scale. If you score it one, it means not like me at all. And if you score it five, it means very much like me. And they're supposed to respond to questions like, I have a hard time breaking breaking bad habits. I say inappropriate things. I do certain things that are bad for me if they're fun. And so they grade themselves, right? Exactly. And then parents and teachers answer those same questions in the third person about that child. So you took all these different things and somehow smooshed them together to get <laughs> sort of one number that quantifies somehow their self-discipline. Exactly. So we created for each child what we called a composite self-discipline score. And then we saw whether that predicted end of the year grade. We did this all in the fall. So then we waited seven months and saw did this composite self-discipline score predict grades, standardized test scores, attendance to school, and so forth seven months later? And if so, did that, compare, did that correlation, was that stronger or less strong than the correlation with IQ? And you found that it was, in fact, stronger as a predictor of grades than just plain IQ. Exactly. In fact, we found it was twice as strong as IQ as a predictor. So does this mean that uh, people that are going through the college admissions process, because I've also been reading these articles about how kids have to do so much more now to get into college than they did when I was young, should they just all have to have an interview and the college admissions officer is going to go, here's $10. <laughs> if you know, you'll come back and talk to me in a week, I'll give you 20. Well, you know, if we could get college admissions officers to do that, um, it probably wouldn't be a bad thing. But um, we've actually had a number of um, college admissions officers and, and other people in education ask us, well, this is a great finding. You know, how do we actually do something with it? Um, and I don't have a great answer for that because giving parents and teachers and kids questionnaires and then throwing money around and waiting a week is not something that's easily done on a large scale. I think the even harder thing to do is to figure out how how would you, if you said about doing it, teach self-discipline? You, I, Were you born with it, or did you achieve greatness in self-discipline? Um, I don't know if I can extrapolate from my own experience, but um, generally what we find is that most personality traits, including self-control and self-discipline, self um, are partly inherited and partly the environment. And if you had to put a fraction on that, people would say about half of the variance is inherited and about half of it is from environment. Um, we would be very surprised if we found a different finding for self-discipline as they find for almost every other personality trait. So, you know, you have something which is born in your genes and something that, you know, somebody can do about uh, from the moment you're born on. The problem is by the time kids get to eighth grade, they've had sort of an infinite number of experiences, both in terms of, you know, the parenting that they've received and also the schools that they went to and every other moment of their day. So, the question is not only can something be done to these children to make them more self-disciplined, but more specifically, you know, what can a teacher do when they're faced with an adolescent who's relatively low in self-discipline, but they're already 13? And is there almost like a programmed learning course that you could imagine where you start with, uh, here's a marshmallow, if you can hold off eating it, I'll give you two in ten minutes, and then you move on to bigger things? Not our own work, but actually there's a psychiatrist named Joe Strayhorn, and um, if you look for his books, they're on Amazon.com, and he actually does have um, what I would call sort of self-help books for six-year-olds and seven-year-olds. Angela Duckworth, this is fascinating. Great idea about the book, but I doubt I'll ever get around to buying it because I just put the <laughs> Right. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you.